Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> well, I thought I would uh, start by explaining how I got <clears throat> involved with uh, McCarthy. I came here, moved to Knoxville as a graduate student in 1962. And a year or so later, uh, a fellow student came up to me one time and uh, said, I got a good friend I want you to meet sometime. Uh, his name is Cormac McCarthy, and uh, he's going to be a writer. <clears throat> he's going to be a really good writer, but he hadn't published anything yet. Uh, as it turned out, I didn't get to uh, to meet him at that time, uh, <clears throat> but I did remember his name. And then in 1965, a couple of years later, I was reading the newspaper and I read a review of a book by Wilma Dykeman. And she reviewed uh, Cormac's first book, The Orchard Keeper. I'll just read a paragraph from her review. <laughs> uh, he said, he has also spent time in and out of the hills around Knoxville, where he has lived since he was four years old. This time was well spent, for he has drawn on memories, both conscious and unconscious, to evoke strong and original descriptions and to present a variety of characters. Well, <clears throat> as a psychologist, I guess I was kind of struck by uh, <clears throat> wondering exactly what an unconscious memory was. And uh, <clears throat> my mother had a birthday coming up. And so I decided I would buy the book for her and give it to her for her birthday. Uh, I went down to Miller's <clears throat> and, and bought the book, came back and started to wrap it up to send it to Atlanta where she lived. And I thought, well, maybe I'll read the book before I send it off. And so I took the dust jacket off uh, carefully and quickly read the book and was really struck by it. Uh, one of the things that struck me were <clears throat> the descriptions of places that I already knew in Knoxville, uh, the courthouse, uh, Gay Street, uh, the Henley Bridge, and so on and so forth. And I thought I knew a whole bunch of other places as well. And I thought that was really pretty neat. Uh, then I finished up my degree. I moved to California, uh, came back on the faculty some years later, and then <clears throat> noticed that he had written some other books while I had been gone and began to read those as they came out. And then, of course, when Sutri came out, I uh, was overwhelmed <clears throat> with it and particularly with uh, all of the places that I was familiar with, uh, some of the characters that I knew, uh, some of the events I was familiar with that had appeared in the newspapers. And so I began uh, keeping some notes on those things and then <clears throat> became interested in documenting, uh, particularly some of the places as they were disappearing in Knoxville uh, with, various construction projects, uh, places would go out of business and or be torn down. And I thought somebody ought to document those. And I began uh, taking some photographs of the places that still remained when I started about 20 years ago. And then eventually put those up on a website called Searching for Sutri that uh, has achieved some degree of popularity uh, where I <clears throat> have some of those photographs and little excerpts from the novel uh, about the places they, des describing the places in the novel. And then I went back to his earlier works, uh, The Orchard Keeper and Child of the God, and have done somewhat similar things with them, although I haven't uh, written very much or uh, publicized that work yet. Uh, I find him really terribly appealing and I, I don't know how many times I've read the book now, but uh, it's one book that I keep going back to and finding something new every time I do it. So I guess I'll stop talking here and let Bill have something to say. Thanks a lot, Wes. And, and I want to mention that we're going to show uh, in just a few minutes, show a lot of uh, photographs from the era of Cormac and Sutri uh, of downtown Knoxville and that are kind of show that, that he wasn't making this stuff up that a lot of people assume when they read Sutri that uh, that he's making this this stuff up about all these people living by the river and so forth but we're uh, we, we're lucky to have a lot of 
historic photographs, thanks to two very different sources. Uh, but we'll be uh, talking about those soon. Uh, but our, our other guest is uh, Bill Hardwick, who teaches uh, uh, and, and studies uh, American literature at the uh, University of Tennessee. Uh, Bill Hardwig has done some projects having to do with literature in Knoxville, including a, a, a early guide to places uh, and uh, connecting to Knoxville writers, including McCarthy and Agee and others. Um, but uh, but Bill uh, is is with us. He's he's working on a project about uh, Cormac's uh, interesting writing style, which I think we can say is distinctive uh, and perhaps unique. Uh, Bill. Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, I'll just briefly introduce myself. Um, I came to Cormac McCarthy probably like a lot of the rest of you, uh, just enjoying his reading mostly for fun. Um, but then when I started teaching at UT, I started teaching an Appalachian literature class. And that's where I really got involved more heavily with McCarthy. I started to teach his third novel, which I think Jack's going to talk about in a second, uh, Child of God in an Appalachian uh, literature context. And um, for those of you who know that book, you know, it's a very disturbing, graphic, and um, sometimes almost overwhelming book. But it's the book that I've taught more than anything else where students have thanked me for introducing them to the book and to the author. So I think there's a real appreciation for uh, McCarthy's writing and the things he's trying to do from students, which led me into research interests. So then as... Um, Jack mentioned, I'm, I'm writing, working on a book called How Cormac Works, where it talks about his language and his style, because one of the things that it, um, I've discovered is that is for all the different reasons people like McCarthy, it's usually they were originally drawn to him by some phrase, some passage, some description that really captured their attention. So I'm just going to uh, exploring that stuff in my work. So it's great to be here. Well, thanks, Bill. How soon will that be finished? Do you have any idea about that, Bill? That, um, that's a good question. We hope, uh, I hope in a, a matter of months, so it'll probably take a little while after that before it shows up in print, but um, yeah. yeah. And, and I've been wondering if uh, who's going to have the temerity to, to write a biography of, of Cormac McCarthy. Uh, people have been talking about that for years, and I think they've been kind of intimidated by the, the man himself about what, uh, about the fact that he's uh he, he was still there. And I wonder uh, if uh, people are going to be, uh, we'll, we'll see a, a slew of biographies in the next 10 years or so. Yeah, it would be sort of daunting because some of the basic aspects of his life aren't part of public record yet. So there's a lot of discovery, yeah. I think, to write that biography. Yeah, yeah it's, same was true with Shakespeare. So yeah, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, well, uh, we let's start our slideshow, uh, 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 Paul, and uh, see... Uh, See where we go from there. Now, this is uh, again we're we're celebrating uh, Cormac's 90th birthday, and uh, and thanks to Charles Jones, who's a uh, one of our most regular uh, attendees to these sessions. And this is the very first novel by Cormac McCarthy that uh, that Wes was talking about, The Orchard Keeper, it came out in 1965. A lot of it's set in South Knox County. It's kind of a more rural novel, but it's got some some of the best descriptions of Market Square that I've ever seen anywhere uh, in the Orchard Keeper, the uh, uh, very thick and, and dense descriptions of, of the place as it was around 1940. Uh, and, uh, uh, but that got, uh, that got attention with critics in 1965, but uh, not, not, a, a, not major sales. It was not a bestseller, uh, but it, it did get uh, attention of, uh, of some interesting critics up at Harvard and elsewhere. So this is a, this is a new uh, force to be reckoned with in American literature. And he was only what, 30, Two years old or so at the time, um, but uh, and the next two were uh, were Outer Dark, uh, which we uh, uh, I mentioned very briefly earlier. It's kind of a allegorical sort of a novel, kind of a dark uh, novel uh, set in some unnamed place, uh, which has that has something in common with the road, where there aren't names of places. But uh, but Outer Dark is uh, is is an interesting novel that kind of stands apart from some of the others. And Child of God, as Bill was talking about, is a is a severe uh, uh, novel. I'm not going to go into detail about it. It's set uh, mainly in Sevier County, uh, and and Wes I think has done some work about exactly the places that have been uh, that he was evoking in that in that book, which uh, which troubled a lot of people, including my grandmother <laughs> when she when she picked it up. <laughs> Uh, she was trying to keep up with new uh, with new literature, and uh, and that was uh, that was not one she recommended to her friends, I think. But uh, 
But uh, uh, next one, please. Uh, and here's, of course, Sutri, which came out in 1979, but it's based in uh, Knoxville 1951 and a little bit after that. Uh, but a fascinating novel, very thickly, thickly detailed novel about uh, people in the city of Knoxville. Um, and uh, one that, uh, as, as Wes mentioned, rewards uh, multiple readings. I have a friend who's a math professor at UT who reads it uh, every every summer and finds something new in it. Uh, and uh, I've read it three or four times, but I, I know a lot of people have read it many more times than that, and and we'll we'll, we'll read it more. It's a, it's a, a fascinating, a thick, complicated novel, uh, and a very I think Cormac's funniest novel, perhaps. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's something that I I don't recommend to everybody, but it's it's uh, one of uh, one of my favorites, certainly. Um, next one, please. We have, uh, okay, we have, uh, I'll let Bill talk more about this. I, I learned about this lady, uh, Swiss journalist Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach, uh, who just happened to uh, come through town back in 1937, a very, very interesting time that we were actually about to publish, uh, to uh, put on our website, a, uh, a story about the, the communists of Knoxville in 1937. That was kind of the high point of the, the, the extreme uh, left wing in town, uh, it's uh, it, which is a pretty fascinating story. I'll, I'll leave it at that until we until we put this out. But a uh, uh, very interesting time to for anyone to come here. And she came here and she was uh, kind of appalled and fascinated with the place and took a lot of pictures and and also wrote about it. She's mainly a writer, but well known writer who kind of, has kind of a cult following in Europe. Uh, but uh, but she came here and it was kind of a travel log that she wrote about her trip through uh, through America. Uh, but Bill, uh, let, let's let's uh, talk about these and how they pertain to uh, Cormac's universe. Yeah, we yeah. we thought that since we're celebrating McCarthy's birthday, we might look at some photos that aren't often seen um, of Knoxville and uh, read a few passages of McCarthy that relates to those. So we thought of Schwarzenbach um, um, from one level, the idea of a sort of fiercely independent Swiss photojournalist uh, who was openly lesbian and sort of had communist or at least leftist leanings. And Cormac McCarthy may not um, feel like the, the most related, but they were actually sort of interested in very similar parts of Knoxville. They were interested in the social interactions that happened downtown, the social stratification, and the way that you had different types of interactions downtown. They were also, also interested in the fringes of the downtown, the places that aren't maybe as policed or as, um, you know, developed as the the downtown that we know of today. And that's mainly down towards the river. And I think in a second, Wes is going to talk about some of the um, some of the stuff down by the river. Um, but I thought what we would do is look at a few images that so all these images that I'm going to be looking at are from Anna Marie Schwarzenbach taken from her trip in 1937. Um, we can just sort of scroll through the first three. I don't have individual things for all these, but all these are taken downtown. This is the old market house at, in Market Square and people around in there. Um, and I thought I'd start with a quote from McCarthy at the very prologue of Sutri. Um, and he writes, sort of introducing the reader to his subject. He said, we are come to a world within the world in these alien reaches, these mogger sinks and interstitial wastes that the righteous see from carriage and car, another life dreams. And for me, that's always been um, a quote that's really helped explain the book. He's interested in what are the stories that the righteous um, people of society see from their car, but don't engage with, pass on by, ignore, or move quickly past. He, so he wants to look at the, the aspects of society um, that are yeah more on the fringes. So um, that was also of interest to Schwarzenbach. So these first three, excuse me, three images, we can just sort of scroll through them. Um, she's interested in the people downtown. So all of these are either um, on Gay Street or in Market Square. And she was also interested as the way that McCarthy was in sort of the racial segregation of Knoxville too. So she, I think, as perhaps a European person and as a, a really independent person, went into some aspects, some areas of Knoxville where a lot of photojournalists were not going at the time. Uh, these aren't great examples of that because most of these are right downtown, but she does take close-up pictures of 
um, African-American subjects, which was something that not a lot of white photographers were doing at the period. Um, you know, McCarthy, too, sort of was interested in the way that the, the town was divided, both uh, sort of by class and by race. At one point in Sutri, um, as as the main character Sutri is walking around, he says, he'd come from the dwelling streets of whites to those of blacks and no gray middle folk did he see. And that's a little bit being a little bit funny, but the idea, the idea is that there's not really interaction between uh, white Knoxville and black Knoxville at the time, um, at least not very much legitimate engagement. So um, these, these are the scenes that both Schwarzenbach and McCarthy were interested. If we could go ahead, I think maybe two more and then we'll come back to the market house. Um, so yeah, if we could skip that one. I wanted to read one passage from McCarthy because one of the things McCarthy does so well in Sutri is bring to life imaginatively what it would have been like to live here in 1951. Now he was, you know, making, this was an imaginative exercise for him, but it's, he has such, um, reading certain passages, almost like a sensory overload. So I'm going to be read one passage of Sutri just wandering around Market Square during a farmer's market. So this image shows a cart with produce on it. He'll mention that. And just notice that how when McCarthy writes this scene, he pulls on all of our senses. He talks about smells, sounds, sights, um, and all this stuff as he just explains Sutri walking around Market Square in 1951. Sutri going past rows of derelict trucks piled with produce and flowers, an atmosphere rank with country commerce, a reek of farm goods in the air, tending off into a light surmise of putrefaction and decay. Pariahs adorn the walk and blind singers and organists and psalmists with mouth harps wandered up and down past hardware stores and meat markets and little tobacco shops. A strong smell of feed in the hot noon like working mash. Mute and roosting peddlers watching from their wagon beds and flower ladies in their bonnets like cowled gnomes. Driftwood hands composed in their apron laps and their underlips swollen with snuff. He went among vendors and beggars and wild street preachers, haranguing a lost world with a vigor unknown to the sane. Sutri admired them with their hot eyes and their dog-eared Bibles. God's barkers gone forth into the world like the prophets of old. And one of the things I think that's so unique about this book and McCarthy in general is just how much attention he plays to the details. So if you think about all the scenes he brought to, to, to our mind in just that one passage, um, Sutri is like 500 pages of different examples of that. Um, if we could back up one page, I thought one of the things, uh, or one slide, one of the things that's a little different between McCarthy and Schwarzenbach is McCarthy is also interested in Knoxville itself. And he had some particularly um, sort of humorous and telling um, quotes about Knoxville arch architecture. So I thought I'd just quickly read a couple of these. The first one is talking about the market house, which you see here, which uh, if you don't know, used to be in the middle of Market Square. It burned down, I think in the 60s. Um, and so he's, the first quote is referring to this uh, building that we see up here, which was in Market Square. He passed under the shade of the market house where brick the color of dried blood rose turreted, coupled, and crazed into the heat of the day, form on form in demented accretion without precedent or counterpart in the annals of architecture. And that seems to be one of his themes in here, just the sort of craziness and the unplanned nature of um, Knoxville architecture. This one other passage that um, gives the experience of that is uh, as follows. The buildings stamped against the night are like a rampart to the farther world, to a farther world forsaken, old purposes forgot. The city constructed on no known paradigm, a mongrel architecture reading back through the works of man <laughs> and a brief delineation of the aberrant, disordered, and mad. A carnival of shapes upreared on the river plain that has dried up the sap of the earth for miles about. I think in both of those, you can see this idea of this crazed, uh, mad aspect of Knoxville, which is something that McCarthy uses to describe it in 1951. Um, if we can, I just got a couple more things here. If we can just scoot ahead two images here. 
So again, one of the things that Schwarzenbach was interested in was the fringes of, of the city. And for Schwarzenbach and McCarthy, the place where you could see that the most was in between the downtown up on the hill and the sort of slope going down to the river. Uh, Neyland Drive was not there. Um, there was a, a little road called Front Street. I think Wes is going to show some images of that. But this became a real metaphor for both Schwarzenbach and McCarthy for the interaction of people. Uh, the, the kind of interactions you had on Market Square were different than the ones you had down here. Just so you can see in this image, Gay, the Gay Street Bridge is right there. You can see the Andrew Johnson Hotel behind it. And this would have been a slope going down to the river. Um, and so, yeah, we can just sort of look at this one and the next image. And then this is one of my favorite images that she took. It's such a striking photo from the same area. You can sort of see the less established um, buildings as you start moving down the hill from mm -hmm. Gay Street. Um, and then the last image, and I'll read one last quote as we look at this image. This is another beautiful one under the Gay Street, or I mean, yeah, under the Gay Street Bridge of a boy playing there. And my last quote is, if you've read the novel, you will know the character named Harrogate, who comes from the country into the city and tries to figure out how city life works, looking for a place to live, uh, a means to survive. And so this is the description of him first going across a bridge and down towards the river, which I think will transition to what Wes wants to talk about today. So this is Harrogate wandering down the hill towards the river. He crossed into the city and descended a steep path at the end of the bridge, swinging down through a jungle of small locust trees filled with long spikes and blackened starlings that flew shrieking out over the river and circled and came back. He emerged into a barren apron of clay beneath the bridge, small black children playing there in the cool, below them a black and narrow street. I think it can be kind of hard to imagine this area of Knoxville is undeveloped and kind of um, cut off from the rest of downtown. But I think as West will show, that was very much the way it was at one point. So I will stop there and turn it over to Wes. Yeah, and by the way, uh, Wes is going to show some uh, some some pictures of uh, made by the Tennessee Valley, Valley Authority. Uh, we have another anniversary coming up, and that is the fact that the uh, it was 80 years ago this summer that uh, they closed the locks on Fort Loudon Dam. Uh, TVA closed the locks on Fort Loudon Dam and formed uh, Fort Loudon Lake, and kind of changed the Tennessee River uh, in a in a very substantial way. Uh, but just before they did, they went around and took pictures of all the people who would be affected by this and more or less everybody up and down the river. In fact, I think many of th these people's lives uh, were affected more than others. But the uh, in Knoxville, the, the river width didn't, uh, in downtown, the river width didn't change all that much. And a lot of the people who were living there in the early uh, 40s were still there uh, 10 years later. But uh, Wes, uh, you want to you want to talk about these? We're really lucky to have this <clears throat> extraordinary document. I think of of of, of images. Well, uh, let me say that I guess you or Paul and I independently came across these uh, photographs that were made by TVA. Yeah, I, uh, I first ran TVA in their in their uh, in their library downtown used to have this in a in a scrapbook. And, and I would just go in there and look at the scrapbook. And, and we at Metropulse, we published a few of them probably 20 years ago and I would lost them. And, and I thought, gosh, I really wish I could ha had get, gotten good digital images of those back then. But I should have guessed that TVA had has good digital images of them. So and they're fairly, uh, fairly liberal with uh, <laughs> with allowing people to use them. But well, yeah. yeah, and that was where I first saw the some of those pictures as well. And um, some years later, I wanted to go back and look at them again. And of course, TVA had uh, closed their library or, uh, and sent many of their holdings to an archive. And I finally traced down where the archive was. And the archive is in Atlanta, uh, where they reside. And I corresponded with the archivist down there, and she was able to locate uh, the photographs. And there were really quite a few of them, I, you know, probably 80 or so or more uh, photographs. 
a good bit more than I had seen at the TPA library in the scrapbook. Uh, so I, I asked for scans of those and got those. And I think Paul may have done a, a similar thing to get uh, some of the scans. So uh, we kind of duplicated our efforts. And in some of these pictures, I, I can't see them well enough on my screen to be able to, to identify them. Uh, other than to say that in many of them, we can see uh, one, either the Gay Street Bridge or the Henley Bridge uh, in the background, and that would help uh, locate that, the location of the shacks. And they were down along the, the north side of the river uh, in an area that TVA referred to, and maybe other people did as well, as Shack Town uh, for this particular uh, bit of shoreline. So maybe we can just go on through them and I'll, I'll have something to say about one of them when we get to that. Uh, there's a mention <laughs> the Henley Henley Bridge or the Henley Street Bridge in, in the background uh, there and that's pretty easy to in, in the Gay Street Bridge in the in the farther background so that you can tell very easily that's uh, very near where uh, I guess Maplehurst is uh, not far from UT um, with a couple of uh, couple of women in a, in a small one, probably one of the better shacks down there. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, 98E, okay. And, and then I also, at, uh, at the History Center downtown, ran across a folder of reports. Evidently, uh, TVA had uh, relocation workers <clears throat> that would go to these shacks and houseboats in the area uh, to interview people who would be affected by the, the rising water. Uh, and they would be forced <clears throat> out of their homes and PVA evidently had felt some responsibility to help relocate these people. And so they sent these workers out to interview them and to try and help them find in an alternative uh, place to live. And uh, they have on file the reports of the social workers as they went about their duties. And some of those are particularly interesting. And uh, <clears throat> maybe when we get to the, the first one, I'll, I'll uh, read in detail, a little more detail about the inhabitants. So why don't we just go through them and then. Uh... Okay. Let's, uh, yeah, let's move in, uh, ahead, Paul, one more. And here's some more. There's a, a great, yeah, these are just, and you can tell that this area uh, flooded on a regular basis in those days because there's, uh, that, that's kind of a, a floodplain that these people are living on and they, most of them are squatters. They, it's not, uh, they just, that's, there we they they didn't use the word homeless back then because the homeless homeless people built houses uh you know just where they wanted to build them and stayed as long as they were allowed to stay uh that was their homes um so that was that, that's interesting how our evolution of terminology has been but well yeah and and you'll notice that many of them are up on stilts yeah uh, because of the frequent flooding that took yeah. place uh and the uh, the inhabitants felt as if they owned the houses, and they did. They didn't mm -hmm. own the land underneath it, uh, but they would pay rent to have their houses, which they oftentimes built or moved to that location. And they would have a, a kind of a token rent that they would pay the landowner owner mm -hmm. like 50 cents a month uh, to be able to squat on the land. Yeah. And and by the way, people who haven't read the book, the relevance to Sutri is that a lot of Sutri, the novel, takes place down here on the river. Sutri himself lives in a houseboat on the river and uh, describes these kind of dense neighborhoods where people had little little gardens, like tiny farms down here, uh, and just kind of lived in in whatever uh, association with their neighbors as they as they could 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 bear, I guess. Yes. Uh, but uh, but it's uh, a lot of people have assumed that read Sutri and assume that this is fiction, that he just, MacArthur just made this up. And this is really proof that this was 
pretty his his descriptions of the area were pretty accurate. And by the way, David Madden describes this area as well in his novel Bijou uh, in in great detail. But here here's a, one of those. They look like tiny farms. They're you know corn. <coughs> uh, uh, I can recognize corn and who knows what other crops down there. But yeah, these, yeah. Uh, and uh, and this was taken off of the Gay Street Bridge, looking down toward First Creek. And you east. can see the railroad line, which is still there uh, on the left-hand side of the picture. Yeah, basically where Calhoun's is now. <laughs> and, and then the and, squatter and, shacks. Yeah. Uh, First Creek is out at the far top of the picture. And yeah. then I like to think, if you look very closely at it, maybe enlarge it somehow, that that's Sutri out there in his <laughs> rowboat yeah. uh, in, the, in the river. I, I, I can't dispute that, Wes. You might right. be right. Okay, here's the first. This is an example of, uh, yeah, some of the uh, reports on one of the owners, and we'll get to the, their house. I think this is uh, uh, Oglesby. Oglesby, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, nice and that's uh, listing the members of the family. Uh, they had a bunch, I think, had five children. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's nice that. These kids uh, went to Bell House School. Bell House School is also mentioned in Sutri. And, uh, yeah, that was located. And up, Ann uh, Armstrong, whose yeah. book has recently been released, uh, taught there probably about that time. That was Knoxville's first public school for white children. And it was up on State Street uh, near uh, what uh, uh, Cumberland uh, about is where it was. Um, not far from Blunt yeah. Mansion. Right. And then I'll go ahead and I think I can read. Uh, oh, that's the second page of the report. And I'll read the first page. I think you can go out one more slide, maybe. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> uh, this is the that was the home of uh, Pete Oglesby. And I don't think we want we go over to the next one, which should be the slide. Showing the house. Uh, there, yeah, that's yeah. the house. The houseboat. And the Oglesby family has received more publicity than any household in the riverfront section. Pete and his father, Lawson Oglesby, have recovered untold bodies of suicide cases and victims of accidents on the river in and near Knoxville. Uh, and the, the novel Sutri opens up with the recover of a, recovery of a suicide body who has jumped off the Gay Street Bridge and has been hauled out on the shore, uh, interestingly enough. Mr. Lawson Oglesby is looked upon as the dean of all local rivermen. He reared a large family near the site where Pete now lives. The son now has five children of his own all of whom have been born and reared on the water's edge. These children are fine, husky youngsters who do not seem to have suffered because of their poor sanitary conditions under which they live. This old houseboat, which now for many years has been dragged ashore, was formerly the scene of many terrible brawls, including the murder of its former, former occupant. Not much has been done to make it habitable uh, for the last few years. Mr. Lawson Oglesby is understood to be the present owner. It is much nearer the river's edge than any of the other shanties of the locality. And of course it's near the river's edge because it was originally a houseboat that was just drug up on the shore. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that gives a little feel for what uh, these reports contain and yeah. i think they're kind of fascinating to read it really are and thanks for sharing that wes uh, and you may know that uh that De uh, cormac's brother dennis has uh said that this houseboat was still visible when they were children and that that it was he he dennis said that he thinks this seeing this houseboat is what inspired 
Cormac to, to locate Sutri uh, uh, down there in a houseboat. His houseboat was, I don't think, a two-story. It was a one-story, right? And I think it was right. in the water. Uh, not, yeah, not, and I think uh, it was sitting up. on top of, as I recall, some 55-gallon um, drum, steel drums yeah, rather, yeah, than, yeah. Uh, rather, rather than on a barge. Yeah. But this was roughly the location, I think, of, right. uh, of, of, of Sutri's houseboat. Yep. Hey, Jack and Wes, this is Paul. We've got a question in the chat asking, are these family case records available to researchers? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, through TVA. Well, the, I found them in the McClung collection. Okay. Uh, Thank you. And another interesting sort of connection to McCarthy with all this stuff is, as Jack mentioned, McCarthy's family moved here because his father was legal counsel for TBA and was involved in some ways helping to deal with these displacements and this of people through TBA, through damming and that kind of stuff. So um, McCarthy in his fiction has a lot of, uh, I don't know, strained relationships with fathers and a lot of examples, especially in his early stuff of being sort of anti-organizations and agencies that try to control people's freedom. So it's, it's fascinating to think about him living, growing up in a household where his father was part of this. And then we also see the, you know, the documentation comes from the very process that was also um, involved in those displacements. Yeah. 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 This is a fascinating picture of a of a of, a, of another houseboat that is uh, perhaps afloat, but it is not very well connected to that uh, that stern wheeler or whatever it is that uh, that paddle uh, wheeler thing. I, I guess that's a, a remnant of some other boat, perhaps. But one one thing, Sutri doesn't have a lot about children in it, uh, and uh, there you see you notice the children uh, in the in these in these photographs. Here's another, perhaps houseboat or just a, just a, a drifting house, with the, again the Henley Bridge in the background. And some more shots of of kids and a, and a and I guess a mother. And this is a striking shot. I don't remember seeing this the first time that we uh, we researched these uh, photographs. Uh, it looks like a house that's just slipped into the river and it's just kind of a, a skew uh, there. I don't know if anyone tried to live in that one, um, but uh, that's a that's a. a, a striking photograph did we uh have we lost wes uh, is he uh hope, hope he makes his way back we hear more of those shanties uh, down there right next to each other some of these shanties, uh, i think tda described there were four different shanty towns distinctively different ones and one was mostly black people and the other were three were white people and they had different names. Uh, one was called Roseville because it was near the Rose Lumber Company on the south side. But uh, I think most of them were on the north side of the river. Yeah, and I think where now First Creek is, I mean, First Creek goes up where now James White Parkway sort of separates East and East Knoxville and downtown. There was a lot of the the, the shanties went up into that creek, uh, sort of a swampy area as well. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, first there's a good deal of that in in Sutri. Yeah, and I, in fact, I remember in First Creek uh, before they built the uh, before they buried it under James White Parkway, uh, there were still uh, people, mainly black people, living up and down First Creek, and you could you could see them down below the uh, the uh, Clinch Avenue Viaduct, Church Avenue Viaduct. Next one, please. Am I still, am I back on there, there you are, yeah, yeah. yeah welcome on. back, Wes, right. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah we're done. We haven't gone very far beyond where we were. <laughs> Here's another, again, near the Henley Bridge, very close to the Henley Bridge, this uh, family living there. Yes, it was evidently a very vibrant community, and uh, 
it lasted several generations. Um, yeah. You know, I've read about the river, the river boatmen who were, were very proud of the fact that they could recover bodies and and uh, and and sometimes help uh, pull out boats and that sort of thing. But they had little businesses, obviously, up and down the river as well. <laughs> yeah, this was a, a family that uh, had a boat rental business there. They rented rowboats out. Uh, and the man also repaired uh, early outboard motors uh, for people who had an outboard motor yeah and we'll ask about where they got their water I, I i hope they didn't get it from the river i think there were probably uh even for for poor people sources some sources of water yeah i think they did have city water at the time these were were taken uh one of the reports mentioned that a bunch of the houses uh were located around a spigot so that they <laughs> that came from the the city so that they could uh, get water. Yeah. And and McCarthy has some wonderfully, uh, well, disturbing images or descriptions of the river and just how dirty it was, how polluted it was, what you could see yes. floating through there. So if it was anything like he was describing, back to Will's comment, yeah, and Jack's, we certainly hope many people were not drinking directly out of the, the river. Yeah. Yeah, the most horrific stuff. Uh, 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 the most horrific stuff in some of McCarthy's work is the, the violence. But in Sutri, there's there's uh, the most horrific stuff is the stuff he sees floating in the in the river. But, um, <laughs> but you, you can see uh, you can see the Gay Street Bridge in the background of this. So this is again on the on the east side of the Gay Street Bridge, over close to uh, to First Creek and in that area. Mm -hmm. Right. How far from where the in Shack Town. Yeah, where the where the Star of Knoxville, the river boats and that, that sort of thing uh, takes off from today. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Yeah, here's one with some corrugated uh, steel or aluminum uh, siding of these uh, these houses. Another thing that McCarthy really describes uh, vibrantly in the novel is is winter. What winter would have been like in these these kind of either on the on the water or in these shacks and just how little insulation there was um, and how cold the wind would blow right through these kind of buildings. Yeah. Yes, most of them, you could see a, 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 a chimney pipe. So they probably had a pot-bellied stove of some kind. Uh, uh, and speaking of, it looks like there is laundry day, do you think? Is that what they're doing there? Or, or? Yes. I, I, yeah. And I think that may have been under the Hill Street viaduct if i'm oh. guessing right yeah. not far from where uh mr harrogate lived yeah all right speaking of this uh, we this is a modern picture uh we've taken of what uh what people call harrogate's lair uh this is underneath the uh the uh, Hill Avenue viaduct uh and this is described uh Sutri's good friend Gene Harrogate uh, found the best place for a, a homeless person to live in town was was in this hole right here, and uh, that was that was where he uh, found his place to live, and uh, he he seemed kind of proud of it. Uh, but it was. Me, I have I have a quote describing this area if we'd like to hear it. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So this is yeah from right under that viaduct um, from the perspective of Harrogate, and it says. The viaduct spanned a jungly gut filled with rubble and wreckage and a few packing crate shacks inhabited by transient blacks. And down through this pooling waste, the dark and leprous waters of First Creek threaded the sumac and poison ivy. Harrogate made his way through this derelict fairyland toward the final concrete arches of the viaduct where they ran to earth. There was a little concrete pillbox filled with pipes and conduits where you could store things and with the weeds grown about outside, there was never a retreat so secluded. Yeah. And, and by the way, to, and, help place, yeah, to help place this, that's the back of the Craighead Jackson House, circa 1818, Craighead Jackson House near Blunt Mansion over to the left. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, show one more picture, uh, if I can, of that. Uh, and that, I don't know if you can see this or not, but it appears in a book by Peter Joseph called Cormac. McCarthy's house. And he has a picture 
uh, an older picture of Harrogate's lair yeah. uh, with some disreputable character looking in it. Uh, yeah. Can you see that okay? I, I can see part of it. I, I can't see how how disreputable the character is, but that's... Uh... I, I know him well. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I bet you do. Yeah, that, that was still inhabited till probably five or six years ago when the city, uh, I, I think, very attractively <laughs> locked it off. Uh, yeah. There was a, as a nice little gate there, but, but people don't live in there anymore. Yeah, I think the first person I ever knew who actually climbed in there was your, your Australian scholar friend uh, who was, who was here. And I was kind of amazed that she had her temerity to go in and, uh, <laughs> and, and take some pictures of what she found inside there. Um, I wonder if they're published somewhere. But uh, well, she's quite an explorer. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Oh, and we show showing a picture of where the uh, where the huddle was. This is uh, on Carmel Avenue, just down from the Bijou Theater, just a little bit downhill. It was uh, kind of the basement of Cook, what's known as Cook Lofts. Uh, but the huddle was a uh, kind of a long uh, uh, bio level uh, bar. Uh, that was still there until about 1981 or so. But it was kind of a a, a bar that was extremely liberal, liberal, and who uh, who they uh, who they consider patrons. And uh, it they it became it developed a reputation over the years as a gay bar. But then Sutri is just a bar that would accept anybody that was not welcome at any other bar, probably. So it was a uh, it's a it's a frequent uh, hangout of the people in in uh, in Sutri. It was also uh, a favorite of the journalists downtown from the, yeah. the newspapers. The, 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 both newspaper offices were not far from there, just around the right. corner. That's right. So for those who may be trying to picture where this is on Cumberland Avenue, it's pretty much right by the Bijou Theater. If you are at the corner of the Bijou Theater and then go down the hill um, away from it's down. Diagonally down. across, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to see it reopen uh, as as uh, as the new the new huddle sometime. All right, uh, next one. Yeah, here's uh, just a a shot of uh, Blood Meridian, which uh, it, its connection to Knoxville. It's a western, uh, and it, it's maybe one of his best known novels that hasn't been made into a movie yet, but it's being made that they they rumored to be made into a movie very soon. Um, but uh, this, uh, its only connection to Knoxville is that he wrote a substantial part of, of Blood Meridian uh, after he moved back to, uh, to Knoxville for a short time, uh, for a year or two, when he lived in a, in a motel in, in Bearden. And we might have a picture of that fairly soon. Yeah, in fact, here it is. The Colony Motel was, uh, is where we have identified uh, where Cormac lived around 1980. Uh, and he was a... Uh, a regular, we have a, an ad for Draper Books because he was a regular there and got to know the dog at Draper Books. And I've talked to the uh, proprietor of, of and, and and she said he was a always alone, just came in by himself, uh, usually a time when the, there weren't other people there and would uh, would would look around at the bookstore. Um, but uh, but he, I think he just won the MacArthur uh, Genius Award at the time. He he lived uh, in you know just completely anonymously. In, a, in an old motel, I, I think probably the last surviving motel of the whole Bearden tourism era, um, but uh, but not a bad place to live for a, a guy who wants to you know concentrate on writing a, a great book. And then the photographer Mark Morrow uh, visited him there and took uh, a series of pictures, one of which I think appeared on the back cover, the author picture of Blood, Blood Meridian. Oh really? No kidding. No kidding. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. No, that's the author picture. I'm sorry. Uh, he has it on one of the books. But um, all right. What else we have, Paul? Yeah, here are just uh, some other other pictures uh, of, of books. Uh, these are the, this the the uh, border trilogy is called. These three books are one of his his uh, great accomplishments. Uh, these three books uh, should be read together. Of course, all the pretty horses have been made into a movie. Um, 
And it was really all the pretty horses that brought him national claim when that was published in 1992. Yeah. Um, that was yeah. his first bestseller, uh, do you think? Uh, or Yeah. 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 Yep. Uh, so Blood Meridian is considered by a lot of people his best work, but it wasn't read nearly as widely as all the pretty horses when they both came out originally. Yeah, yeah. And here are a few more. Uh, uh, the Road is worth mentioning because, uh, well, maybe we lost Jack. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you have, yeah, the Road uh, also comes through Knoxville, and the protagonist, the father in the Road, takes his son out to a house. Uh, he goes over the Henley Bridge and out to a house, and the house he describes is the one that Cormac grew up in. Did you want to read that? Do you have that description I, handy? I, I certainly could. Um, and if you don't, if you're not sure it's Knoxville because it doesn't mention, I think it becomes pretty obvious at the beginning, it talks about, it says, by dusk of the day following the day they were at the city, the long concrete sweeps of the interstate exchanges like the ruins of a vast funhouse against the distant murk. So if you can imagine downtown in the interstate exchanges in a place of ruin looking like a vast funhouse. Um, but then, yes, they go across a bridge and it's described as they cross the con high concrete bridge over the river a dock below, small pleasure boats half sunken in the gray water. So this is at some point in the future, but it's interesting to think about um, this character walking across the Henley Street Bridge, looking down to where Sutri was several decades before and sort of imagining that. And then they come to the house um, in South Knoxville. And it says, in the house where I grew up. So a lot of people think that is... Uh, McCarthy writing his own history of growing up in Knoxville into the road, even though there are no names. Yeah, it, it's interesting. There's only in the book I found only one, only one uh, proper name of a place, and it was when they were walking through uh, the Piedmont. And he says Piedmont uh, briefly as they're, yeah. they're they're it's they're wandering from somewhere in the Upper Midwest, and they're they're going to the uh, you know southeastern coast, more or less, probably South Carolina. And uh, and but he just briefly mentions that one word, giving us one clue about where he is. But the uh, description of Knoxville, especially the revisiting the childhood home of the of the main character, makes it very vividly uh, uh, seem seem like seem like Knoxville, uh, and and very a very personal book for Cormac, I think. Yeah, and we don't need to go into great detail, but Wes has done some great detective work where. He's written an article about you can trace it out of town, South Knoxville, through the Smoky Mountains. Um, and um, and yeah, the, there's some markers not named, but that you can identify through that route as well. That's another book that's been a major motion picture as well. Uh, Vigo Mortensen is the, the father figure in that one. Hey, Jack and Bill, we have a question in the chat from Rosalind Hackett and UT as well. Um, can you say more about how best is understood? You understand that question? How best is understood? I wonder if Rosalind could add a little bit more. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. it's in response to something that I said that I forgot that I said. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, you talked about um, his best work. So oh. I'm interested in in whether the concept of best uh, <laughs> evolves uh, and is it best according to critics or best in terms that it's made into a movie? Just could you unpack that concept of best work? Absolutely. Um, and maybe I should have said most critically acclaimed because if you ask people who like McCarthy, what's his best book, you'll probably get seven different answers depending on what they're looking at. So um, it is usually considered, Blood Meridian is often considered his most accomplished literary book, his, his masterpiece, sometimes people say. So best on that way. Other people like The Road more, you know, that might be the one that um, 
is considered the best by the largest number of people. So I wasn't really um, trying to give a loaded thing there. But um, one of the things about McCarthy's work is some of it is really dense and full of illusion. And that is appreciated by some people. Other parts are more minimalist and um, almost breezy. The road sort of which doesn't mean they're not um, big ideas in there, but um, so some of it just comes to a matter of personal taste. Um, but my comment was that I think if you asked a critical, the the critics, most of them would say, not from Knoxville, most of them would, would say Blood Meridian is um, maybe his most accomplished work. There's a substantial minority of us <laughs> that believe it's such a... <laughs> yep. And 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 not just from Knoxville too. Uh, right. Uh, it, it's amazing that uh, I was. I've been amazed how many people, including uh, Steve Inskeep of NPR, can quote long passages from Sutri, uh, in, including the the famous intro, uh, 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 dear dear friend, now in the friend. Du du dusty clockless hours of the town, uh, all that. But um, it's a uh, so it's it's a very personal thing. Uh, Gene Burr is asking about the role of the house that uh, Mark Mill Pike that Cormac lived in. Uh, it was what role is it? Well, they, Corm Cormac lived there from probably the age of seven or eight until he went to college. Uh, and uh, but in the in the uh, in the novel, it it is the home of the protagonist, uh, the childhood home of the protagonist, and he wants to take his son while they're going through this ruined landscape where the only people alive are cannibals uh, are there. He wants to show his son where he grew up in happier times. And it's just a, an extremely uh, 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 contrary sort of uh, scene to, to, to be seeing this devastation and then go into this house and the character wants to find out where they used to hang their Christmas stockings. Uh, at the uh, at the uh, at the mantle of this empty house, and finds the finds the nail holes. Um, and and meanwhile, the child is terrified and wants to leave immediately yeah. by the road. Yeah. He's not feeling the nostalgia of the father. I don't think. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's a bit of an irony that in this in this book where everything is gone except for this house, more or less. Uh, in the real world, everything is still here except that house. So that house burned <laughs> down about about two years after the novel came out. Unfortunately, I'm I'm I was sorry to see it go. Yeah. Hey Jack, I have another question in the chat bar that I don't think you can see because it came directly to me, but it's for Bill. He said, Bill, any comment about why the high style of language does not match the subject in Sutri? Does that make sense? I think so. Um I I um, I mean, I think that's one of the things that's most interesting about McCarthy is he, his tone or his style or the prose often doesn't match what he's writing about. So sometimes he's got very eloquent, beautiful language about very sordid or ugly scenes or scenes of violence. Sometimes he also has very tender language about the least tender um, scenes imaginable. So one of the things I think is interesting about his work across his entire career is just how he uses style and tone often in ways that you wouldn't expect it. So where you might expect some tenderness, you get very um, almost like scientific language sometimes where it seems devoid of any emotion at all and descriptive. At other times where you think he would take a step back, he gives a very emotion-filled sort of flowing high style as, as you called it. So with Sutri, I, I don't know the exact reason for that, except I think he sort of saw Knoxville as sort of his muse for a long time or something. He was going to write an important book for decades and he was working on it and Knoxville was always the center of it. And I think it was those scenes of Knoxville, the sort of gritty Knoxville that um, some people don't want to um, acknowledge. Yeah. Well, I think the narrator is mainly the narrator who has this this high flying language, and the narrator is it seems omniscient and 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 kind of wise about people. And I think he has a respect for everybody they he describes, even though the people themselves speak in the language that they're used to, very very simple uh, language of, uh, of 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 the homeless and the prostitutes and everybody else who populates uh, that that novel. Um, and, uh, uh, and 
but it's uh, it, I think I, I think it's a, to me it seems part of, partly it's respect in a way that and that's one of the things that some of the early scholars of Sutri noted that child of God is about one of the worst kinds of human beings you can imagine, but he's still a, a child of God, and this is uh, just just writing about this this person offers him some respect. He was a uh, was a named Robert Cole up in Harvard was one of the early champions of McCarthy's work. Uh, and uh, that was kind of his his take on on McCarthy uh, that uh, that it was it was kind of a, a sanctification almost of, of ordinary ordinary people. Um, and I think to to go along with that, I think one of the things he does about as well as anybody I know is put in the voices that you're talking about, the voices of working class, the voices of prostitutes, the voices of people from the country. And he's got a real ear for the way people speak and a real yeah. one of the real prizes in his first four novels is the way that he puts local to Tennessee Appalachian voices, Knoxville voices into the novel in a way that resonates is so true. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Paul, do we have another picture? Yeah, well, here are the last uh, couple, and I, I have to admit that I've only read parts of uh, of, of each of them, and uh, but they're uh, they they're a bit of a they're both of a they're both a departure uh, from McCarthy in in theme and style in some ways, but also in a way a return to East Tennessee at the same time because he brings uh, some of the story back around, uh, and uh, uh, but I. I and there's there's some funny uh, passages in the passenger that uh, have been quoted in in the national media about uh, about uh, what makes Knoxville crazy. Um, uh, that uh, <laughs> it, that are, are people uh, the people are, are, are the crazy people come to Knoxville or does, or does Knoxville make them that way? I think is uh, roughly what they what the the uh, philosophical question is. Um, yeah, and although people refer to it as his New Orleans novel uh a a good bit of it takes place in in east tennessee still and uh for instance kingston pike jackson avenue Asheville highway gay street forest avenue and cumberland avenue are are mentioned in the passenger and then places like miller's the old department store here the mcgee tyson airport church of the immaculate conception eastern state hospital Fort Sanders Hospital uh, are also mentioned in the novel. So uh, we he writes he writes really beautifully in the passenger as he does in other novels about the quarries. He the the stone quarries around Knoxville really uh, um, struck McCarthy. They show up in a in very detailed ways in a bunch in in a big scene in the passenger takes place yeah. in in one of the quarries too, and it's just described very beautifully. Yeah. Yeah, my, my contention is that Eastern State has been described in uh, in uh, more novels than uh, by McCarthy and other people, uh, and even uh, a play by Tennessee Williams uh, than than mm -hmm. any other any other mental institution in America, with the possible exception of Bellevue in New York. Uh, anyway, it's uh, uh, <laughs> because I, I see that, and, and it's in uh, it, it's in a couple of two or three of McCarthy's works. Uh, yes, it is. Lions View, or whatever. They called it, and uh, and also in uh, in some of Peter Taylor's books. And uh, uh, anyway, it's it, but it's a it's a, got a fascinating literary heritage that that place we now now know as, as Lakeshore Park. Yep. All right. Well, happy birthday, uh, Corman McCarthy, and uh, I'm sorry uh, again that uh, he, you couldn't be you couldn't be with us. Um, I, got to meet Cormac one time and just had a, a lovely hour with him. He would not talk about his, his life or his work at all, but he was interested in everything else. And uh, I was just impressed with uh, the curiosity of the guy. And it, I think it really comes across in his, in his, uh, in his, in his work. Um, but uh, one, one, one thing that was, I think, nice to see was bef to see the passenger and Stella Morris come out before he passed away and he could see the way that those were being taken seriously. And um, so he could see his final works because he had been working on the passenger since at least the 1980s. Um, so these were important books to him. And I think it's nice to, that they came out um, and he got to see that. 
Yeah, and, and incredible at age 89 that you would publish two novels. And and yeah. I, I've, I've, I've been working all these years on my first one. So it's a, <laughs> it's a, it, it's, it's a, a great achievement. Any other final thoughts, thoughts, either one of you, Wes, uh, Bill, and any other, any other questions out there? Comments? <laughs> the whole well, lot he leaves things. a big hole yeah, uh, yeah. in my life. Um, a lot of my spare time has gone into looking at his work. Uh, and um, I've made an awful lot of friends who have shared the same yeah. uh, kind of experience. So um, he, it's, it's a real it's, personal loss, I think, to a lot of us. Yeah, well, he's still there on the page, and there are thousands of pages if you put them all together. So it's um, you can spend the rest of your life reading Cormac and not and not get very bored. I think it's uh, it, it's really uh, fascinating stuff. Where Nas was he is commemorated. Uh, well, a few places. Uh, there are quotes from him on Market Square and uh, down on the the riverfront uh, in Volunteer Landing. But of course, Sutri Landing Park uh, on the south side is uh, is is a, a tribute to uh, to Sutri. It's the it's the, uh, the site of a scene where uh, what they stole a, a a bad cop's police car and and ran into the river there. Um, uh, but that was uh, uh, where else? Those are those are a few places. Of course, there's a Sutri Bar on uh, on Gay Street. On Gay Street. Right. Yeah, the memorialization is kind of interesting because I think people want to include descriptions of the city, but so many of his things are about the dirt, the grime, the craziness, the depravity, that it can be really tricky mm -hmm. to prove something that um, gives the spirit of it, but also something that you want to memorialize the, your contemporary city with. Yeah, yeah. There's kind of a bar relief, by the way, of, of Cormac in the uh, Hodges Library at UT. Uh, he's one of their notable alumni, even though he was not a graduate. Um, he he did. I think he did learn a few things at UT. That would be an interesting an interesting thesis subject to see what how many of these these crazy words did he learn uh, on the hill um, in the 1950s. Yeah, we have a couple of announcements and then we could go to a um, Q, more Q&A. But I, I want to thank Charles Jones again for sponsoring tonight. Uh, I don't know if Charles is still with us, but um, if anyone would like to help support this ongoing series, uh, please get in touch. Yeah, the question about you, Clarence Browning, <laughs> uh, about, uh, about McCarthy UT, maybe he wasn't all that impressed. Well, he came back three times, I think, to, to UT to, to find more things to, 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 to study there over a period of seven or eight years is my understanding. Uh, so uh, he found some some value in, in there, at least. It's the only, only college he went to. It is interesting how little it shows up in Sutri, though, given how close all of that is to, he mentions, you know, the, the school up on the hill one time. But I, I once did some research. I got interested in what uh, Neyland Stadium would have looked like at the time. And it was a pretty big stadium in the 1950s already. And yeah. Satri would have been rowing his boat back and forth past Neyland Stadium every day. And he describes every type of bush, every everything, but he never mentions uh, the stadium and very rarely mentions UT. Yeah, yeah that, that was one of the, actually that was one of the years that UT won a national championship in football. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, as well. the big one, the big one. Yeah, take that, uh, uh, Coach Neeland. Uh, <laughs> it's left out of get left out of a novel, but it's funny. Uh, James Agee. People have said the same thing about James Agee. That James Agee lived in a hostel that seemed curiously devoid of uh, of a university. Of course, it was much smaller when Agee was was uh, writing about it, but or remembering it. All right. Other questions or comments. We'll come back soon, everybody, and uh, we hope to see you all next uh, next month. Appreciate it.